Well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. My name is Adam White. I'm the director of the C. Boyd and Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State at the George Mason University Antonin Scalia Law School. You have to take a deep breath before you get all that out. Um, it's my pleasure uh, and honor to welcome you all here today for our discussion, all centered around my colleague, Professor Michael Grieva's paper on whether Congress should replace administrative law judges with administrative courts. We'll introduce the paper in a moment, but before we do, I do wanna just introduce you all to the center uh, and to our fellow co-hosts tonight. So the Seaboyd and Gray Center was founded a few years ago by Dean Henry Butler and Professor Naomi Rao, the George Mason uh, Scalia Law School. The idea being that we we're living in a time in which it's very, um, very interesting questions are being raised in administrative law. Some of them old and timeless, some of them new and challenging. And where better to have a center, a home for these debates than right here in Washington, D.C. and Arlington, Virginia. So the center exists to be a home for scholars from across the country to come, write papers, debate, deliberate, discuss, and ultimately elevate and inform the debates surrounding modern administrative law for the benefit of people in Congress, the executive branch, the courts, practitioners, and the public at large. Most of what we do is uh, in the form of supporting legal scholarship, centered around topics that we choose over the course of a year, ranging from due process to free speech to traditional matters of administrative law like Chevron deference. We do a number of these conferences every year in our campus in Arlington, Virginia, and also a number of events like this in downtown Washington. And just to give you a sense of what's coming up, on February 22nd at the law school, we will have a day-long conference on Congress and the administrative state, focusing on the powers that agencies receive from Congress. Uh, our keynote speaker for that, by the way, will be Mr. George F. Will. Uh, we thank Mr. Will for joining us here tonight, too. On March 22nd, we'll have a conference on religion and the administrative state, featuring a keynote speech by Judge Kyle Duncan. Uh, for all these events, we bring in the authors who have written new scholarship for us, and they're paired with other speakers to look, debate and discuss uh, the papers that they've written. Uh, in March 29th, we'll be back here in this space for a topic on or a discussion of political polarization and the administrative state centered around a new book edited by professors at the Claremont McKenna College in Southern California. Going forward, some of our research projects involve the study of benefit cost analysis and centralized White House oversight after two years under the new Executive Order 13771. We'll have a private round, round table discussion in the spring and then a fall conference on campus. Also have a private round table this spring on technology innovation and regulation, bringing together experts on various areas of technology to think about how technology affects and is affected by uh, regulation and vice versa. Now everything we do is under the name of Ambassador C. Boyd and Gray. We're very honored and privileged to do our work at a center that bears his name. Uh, we hope we do justice to his legacy both in public service and his work as a private lawyer, um, developing doctrines of administrative law and helping to improve the work of public administration here in Washington. But it's also fitting that we do our Washington events in this particular building. The, uh, the Decatur House, the former home, well, this is the carriage house, but next door, the former home of uh, Commodore Stephen Decatur, the second building on the, the, uh, the hill that uh, is the site of the White House. Now, if you came in through that entrance back there, you'll see just off to the side, a statue, a bust of the Honorable Gordon Gray, uh, uh, Boyden's father. Uh, our connection to his legacy is both uh, through the name of our, our um, our named sponsor, but also I'd like to think in a way we're continuing in a way the legacy of his work. The reason why he is honored here is for his work with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, understanding that our nation's institutions, our legacy doesn't preserve itself. It requires the hard work of people who dedicate their time and resources and efforts to preserving both the physical uh, built institutions of this city and our nation, but also the intellectual uh, and philosophical institutions that we've inherited from those who came before us. And we hope that our work here at the C. Boyd and Gray Center in its own way helps preserve parts of the nation's legacy. Now for more information on the center, please consult our website, our new and improved website, administrativestate.gmu.edu. You'll see listings of all of our past events, future events, and also coming soon, uh, links to all of the dozens of 
papers that we've sponsored so far in our three years of existence. Soon we'll add to that website, based on the discussion tonight, a new paper by my colleague, Professor Michael Grieva. For now, we have a link to his original essay that started this whole discussion. It appeared on the website Law and Liberty, um, sponsored by the Liberty Fund. And speaking of Law and Liberty, I'll now introduce our co-sponsor and co-host, my friend Richard Reinch. Richard is the founding editor of Law and Liberty, the Liberty Fund's online journal. He also hosts its podcast, and I highly recommend it, Liberty Law Talk. Richard is the author of several books, and his next book, co-authored with the late Peter Lawler, is titled A Constitution in Full, The Unwritten Foundation of American Liberty. We couldn't think of anybody better to co-sponsor this event with than Richard, the Law and Liberty, and the Liberty Fund, and we're so glad that you could join us tonight. So please join me in welcoming Richard Reinch. Thanks, Richard. So as Adam mentioned, um, it's fitting uh, that we're a co-sponsor in this event uh, with the Center for the Study of Administrative State. We're excited about that. And we're also excited to see this particular conversation grow. Writing on the administrative state, the regulatory state has been uh, central uh, to law liberty, to law and liberty's um, existence uh, since we started several years ago. And Michael Grave uh, um, has been a part of that. And um, uh, so our, our earlier version uh, featured commentary from a range of scholars, and, and now that continues. Um, Liberty Fund is uh, the online journal published by Liberty Fund, uh, as would befit uh, such a journal. We um, uh, aim to analyze and discuss questions uh, central to liberty through a return to fundamental text and fundamental ideas. We feature a range of commentary, constitutional, political, regulatory, along with historical and cultural analysis. Um, we have uh, Michael Rappaport, John McGinnis, uh, and James Rogers are three of our regular writers. I host a podcast show, which Adam alluded to, Liberty Law Talk. Um, uh, my next podcast is with uh, Professor Stephen Smith of the University of San Diego School of Law on his new book, Pagans and Christians in the City. So I urge you to check uh, that out. Um, it falls to me to introduce uh, tonight uh, our moderator of our panel, the Honorable uh, Gregory Katsis. Um, the, uh, Judge, Judge Katsis um, was appointed to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals in December of 2017. He graduated from Princeton University and Harvard Law School where he was executive editor on the Harvard Law Review. He served as a law clerk to Clarence Thomas on the DC Circuit and then served as clerk to Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court between 1992 and 2001. He was an associate and partner in Jones Day. He has also served in many senior positions in the Department of Justice and from December, January to December 2017, he served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy Counsel to the President. He has argued more than 75 appeals, including three cases in the Supreme Court 13 cases in the D.C. Circuit and cases in every other federal court of appeals. In short, our panel is in good hands. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, we have a great set of panelists, and my first job is to introduce them. So let's get started. Uh, Michael Grieva is a professor of law at Antonin Scalia Law School, where he teaches administrative law, conflict of laws, constitutional law, federal courts, and legislation. Uh, he serves as a board member of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and he was previously a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. He co-founded the, uh, co the Center for Individual Rights, a public interest law firm specializing in constitutional litigation. He received an undergraduate degree in Germany at the University of Hamburg and a PhD at Cornell. He's written many scholarly books and articles, and one of his forthcoming articles is the subject of today's panel. Jeffrey Lubbers is a professor at American University's Washington College of Law, where he specializes in administrative law. He's served as a consultant to many federal agencies, the World Bank, ABA, USAID, and OECD. Quite a list of acronyms. Um, he's a graduate of Cornell University and the University of Chicago Law School. 
Before joining AU, he held many positions with the Administrative Conference of the United States. In 1993, he served as a leader on Vice President Gore's National Performance Review Team on improving regulatory systems, and he's written many guides and source books for the ABA in the area of administrative law. Robert Gassaway is a lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School, a Washington attorney, and a legal reform advocate. He spent 25 years as a litigator at Kirkland & Ellis. He was a founding member of the National Federation of Independent Business Legal Advisory Board, and he currently serves as chairman of the board for the International Foundation for Research in Experimental Economics. He's published many academic articles and has lectured throughout the world in business, economics, history, law, and politics. He holds degrees from Northwestern University, Yale University, and the University of Chicago Law School. Finally, Adam White, um, as you heard, is the executive director of the Seaboard and Gray Center for uh, the Study of Law and the Administrative State and an assistant professor of law at Antonin Scalia Law School. He, he has a record just as impressive as anyone on the panel, but he asked me to cut short his introduction, and so I will. Let's get on with the show. Um, <laughs> Dr. Grieva is going to lead off um, laying out the basic thesis and argument of his proposal for about 20 minutes, and then our, panel, our other panelists have agreed to take about 10 minutes each to comment um, in the order in which I've introduced them. So, Mike. Thank you. Um, thanks, Judge. Um, I wonder first how this damn thing works. There it is. Um, and I wonder whether the panelists might want to, it, there's a fair bit of legal text and claptrap. If you can't see it, fine. If you, no? No, I'm going to come down. I'd like to see it. <laughs> All right. Um, so thanks, Adam. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Judge, for moderating this. Thanks to my fellow panelists. My key proposition here is that we should decimate a good chunk of the uh, existing ALJ and AJ machinery and replace them with administrative courts, and not just any administrative courts, but Germany's administrative courts. <laughs> Because there is, to my mind, no other way of bringing the regulatory state under control and to restore some modicum of constitutional government. Uh, I admit that that sounds jarring. I mean, to look to the Germans for advice on limited government and law. It's like, you know, asking Venezuela to run our economy. Um, but, um, yeah. There, Friedrich Hayek was a huge admirer of Germany's administrative courts. Um, and the reason why he thought that was, if you have a powerful administrative state, you have, a power, you have to have a powerful judiciary, administrative judiciary um, to match it. Germany built those courts in the late 19th century. Um, the single-minded focus of their administrative law is the protection of individual rights by independent courts. That system became very heavily constitutionalized uh, after 1949. We can't exactly replicate that for all sorts of reasons, um, but we can approximate it, and I'll try to explain why it works remarkably well. We rejected that model of independent administrative courts a century plus ago. The Hayek quote there suggests one reason, right? So A.V. Dicey looked at uh, Germany's courts uh, and hated them because he thought they were part of the bureaucracy. That was a misunderstanding. Um, but as a result, administrative courts got a very bad reputation in the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, and so we instead adopted what's called the appellate review model, which means expert agency adjudication coupled with deferential review in general purpose courts. That's Kroll versus Benson, that's Chevron, that's the APA. I want to revisit and reverse that decision. So this talk is not about a few marginal managerial reforms, it's about rethinking the APA and its foundations. 
Here's how the current debate goes. So this is the basic proposition for the appellate review model. That's Adrian Vermeul, right? Um, everything, the law over time bends toward deference. The reply, the conservative reply to that is that, well, the basic rule of law problem is that we cannot have the same government body, a, a government agency, first write the rule, then uh, prosecute you, and then adjudicate you. That is sort of a basic um, separation of powers problem. We, at least we cannot do that without full-scale um, Article Three review, and so therefore end the she failed Chevron experiment. That is what we're about. My view is that Adrian has this right. There's a slew of reasons, um, but the most basic reason is that once you think of judicial decisions as reviewing a decision that has already been made at least once by an expert with all sorts of procedures, you ask yourself, what can a court actually still contribute to that? And the answer is not an awful lot. Right? The DC Circuit isn't going to sit around wasting its time deciding whether um, a desk calendar is more like a diary or more like a bound book. That's not going to happen. Right? So if you believe in the appellate review model, the courts will never be more than a sort of repair shop for the executive branch. That's not just Adrian's point. That is the intended point of the APA. But. There's no reason why the frontline adjudicators actually have to be appointed by the agency or reversible by the agencies. They could be judges, like in Germany, right? And for my rule of law friends is you cannot repair the Chevron doctrines. That's beyond repair. You should heed the advice of another great Austrian jurist. We need a new vehicle. Um, <laughs> That vehicle cannot be the real Mercedes-Benz, OK? But we can steal the sort of institutional technology and adapt it to our uh, constitutional tradition. So I'll first describe the model, and this will be some very heavy breathing, and then suggest how this might be done. So here's the next slide. Um, these are, if it works, yes. So these are the constitutional foundations, um, right? Um, I won't read through all of that. I'll let you read through it if this works there. The legislature shall be bound by the constitutional order, the executive and the judiciary by law and justice. That's the crucial part. Should any person's rights be violated by the public authority, he may have recourse to the courts. If no other jurisdiction has been established, recourse shall be to the ordinary courts. Judges shall be independent. And extraordinary courts should not be allowed. No one may be removed from the jurisdiction of his lawful judge. That all sounds congenial, except we act as if we don't believe in any of this. Uh, in contrast, in Germany, all of this is unquestioned jurisprudence. So the legislature may not delegate essential decisions to the executive or to the courts. That's their version of the non-delegation doctrine. And unlike ours, it has real bite they send stuff back all the time. Statutes and administrative regulations must, meet, must be definite. Um, that's sort of an anti-seminal rock doctrine, right? If a reg is too vague, it can't be applied to a plaintiff with a legitimate case. Administrative law, judges and adjudication are constitutionally prohibited. Um, that's straight up Article 101. Um, there is a basic administrative procedure, uh, it's, uh, which is called an objection. But you object not to some ALJ. You object to the next higher level of the government to the, in the executive. And it doesn't buy the executive any deference when you do so. Uh, legal protection must be prompt and effective. That sounds blah. But it means that almost all of our administrative procedures would be unconstitutional because they just take too long and keep you from your lawful judge. There must be a form of action and form of effective judicial relief for every potential violation of right. Um, this is totally great and then bad news for German law students because once you know that there is an arguable violation of right, you know there's a form of action. You just don't know which one your prof wants to, you to pick. It's good news for 
plaintiffs and halfway competent lawyers, because you've, if you choose the wrong form of action, the court will and must reinterpret it. And this is the final one. And whatever else you do, don't let Cass Sunstein see this. Um, there's a presumption, strong presumption, in favor of private ordering uh, and private right. What this is is Lochner and drag, right? Um, it's unquestioned jurisprudence. Uh, sometimes it's used to color administrative law doctrines. So, for example, nothing but an affirmative prohibition directed at you can bind you, uh, or a permit or license is if it if a permit or a license isn't granted within three months, it's automatically deemed granted. Um, right? And sometimes courts even use this presumption as a source of constitutional rights. Um, so all of this is embedded in um, deep constitutional presumptions, and it's foremost oriented towards questions of right. Um, these are the basic provisions of the counterpart of the APA. <clears throat> so you have to have independent courts. Recourse to the administrative court shall be available in all public law disputes. Um, and this is the crucial one. The court shall investigate the facts ex officio. Those concerned shall be consulted in doing so. Shall not be bound by the submissions <clears throat> and the motions. Um, this is not an on the record proceeding. This is a real live trial, um, uh, right? And um, the court will do this on its own under the sort of continental inquisitorial model. They will conduct, the courts will conduct the proceedings like ordinary civil courts. Obviously, in our adversarial uh, uh, system, we can't replicate that. But what we can replicate is a de novo standard of review. Next, remedies. <clears throat> so, in, one comment on that. Insofar as the administrative act is unlawful and the plaintiff's rights have been violated, they take the and very seriously, right? So even an un, obviously unlawful administrative act will remain valid unless the plaintiff can show a violation of a right. And section 114 is, <clears throat> this is their version of ultra vires and arbitrary and capricious review, but remember it's de novo, right? Um, in provisions that I've spared you, because this is already too long, uh, the code provides for all kinds of, kinds of remedies, injunctive, monetary, declaratory, conspicuously totally missing from the codes um, is our usual remedy, which is a remand to the agency, right? So the premise is that there is a single correct decision to be made. Either the executive has made that decision or it didn't. And if it didn't, the court will make it. And that means it'll enjoin the administration, award damages or make whole relief if the act is irre irreversible or it will issue the permit or license at issue. There's no room ever for an executive do-over. This is the heart and soul of German administrative law. Um, Pre-enforcement uh, challenges are very strongly disfavored. And the reason is that they're sort of an interest group sport and not really about rights. And then there's de novo review for everyone with rights, but for nobody else, uh, especially, and the reason for that is they're, they're mortally afraid uh, of what we call public interest lawsuits or private attorneys general. <clears throat> I'll talk more about that in a moment. So, I hate this thing. So where do these rights that you have to have come from? Well, they come from the Constitution. <clears throat> um, it's often misunderstood, but the principal safeguard of constitutional rights in Germany is not the constitutional court. It's the administrative courts. Uh, apart from the general freedom to do as you wish that I mentioned earlier, the central right here, uh, the most invoked right, is property. Um, I've mentioned quasi-constitutional doctrines that I want to talk about, talk more about it. And then there's something called protective norm theory. So a protective norm is some legal norm that protects your individual rights. That means real rights, interests aren't enough. There cannot be a right to a carbon-free environment. Again, 
if you just because you're ticked off about something <clears throat> or, uh, or someone doesn't mean you can appoint yourself a private attorney general. Note that all of this, what I just mentioned, is a standing inquiry before it becomes a merits inquiry. Without a plausible rights claim, you cannot get into court. Uh, if you're the target of the administrative action, you always have standing. If you're a third party, you need a protective norm. Again, all of this hangs on the premise that administrative courts have only one purpose, and that is to protect private spheres of conduct and interaction and uh, against government interference. That's not the way we think about it here, but maybe there's an institutional way to recapture that. So here are five elements of what I think courts ought to look like. One mean that independence, that means the judges, okay? Uh, broad jurisdiction, only administrative cases, but substantially all such cases, a few exceptions I'll mention more in a moment. Open to every citizen who can credibly claim to have been violated in by its private rights by an administrative act and to no one else, that is to say, private attorneys general. I'll sketch my ideas about that, but I confess they're not very convincing even to me. This means handle them like an ordinary civil trial, except that one of the parties has a badge. And there must be enough, enough ju judges, enough ad administrative courts, okay? All of, so those are the essentials. Everything else is up for grabs. Who are they appointed by if not the executive? That depends. Wait for the next slide. <laughs> so you could make them Article Three courts. You could make them Article specialized Article Three courts. You could make them Article One courts. You could construct them as adjunct courts. I'd be happy to talk about various ways of appointing them. Um, here is my preferred solution, but again, it is. There. Uh, you could have Article Three courts and Article One courts. So the existing Article Three courts and then Article One courts on the side and then operate a system of jurisdictional competition, right? So you give private parties a choice. You can either have the agency adjudication, which is biased, and then deferential review in, uh, in an ordinary Article Three court. Um, and because that court will be deferential, it's also biased, or you can come to us, but you can't do both. You wanna uh, adjust the jurisdiction accordingly. So it should include all public law, administra public, uh, administrative law cases, except tax disputes, that's separate in Germany as well, leave that to the US tax court. Benefit claims and veterans' benefits, leave that where it is. Even the Germans have a special system for that. They're called social, social courts, largely for historical reasons. The reason why I think that makes sense to keep is that I don't want the administrative courts to become sort of small claims courts, right? I want them to focus on impositions on private parties and not worry about what happens when the government gives away money. <clears throat> Immigration and asylum cases, that's a nightmare or too many cases. For pragmatic reasons, I'd leave that aside. Cases between private parties for constitutional reasons, you probably have to leave that with Article Three courts. Um, Pre-enforcement challenges to administrative rules and regulations, those I would leave, in the Germans leave those to appellate courts for precisely the reason that those are not really litigation over private rights. <clears throat> and I think that would make particular sense here, right? Because what I want these courts to focus on is a dispute between this citizen and that agency. And that's very different structurally from sort of an extended K Street brawl. And we can no longer even tell the difference, um, right? And uh, I think we should try to recover uh, that distinction and relearn how to draw that difference. It's a very, very hard thing to cover, but I thought I'd end on a cheerful conclusion. Oh, sorry, I should say a few words about that. 
if you operate a system like this, de novo review, it's not even review, but de novo decision making, and you let the Sierra Club and Ralph Nader and everybody else, and for that matter, the Competitive Enterprise Institute stroll into court, you know, complaining about somebody else's rights or mobilizing the government to harass or impose upon somebody else, you've achieved the opposite of what you're trying to do, and so therefore you have to exclude those kinds of cases from these courts altogether. Um, and the only way I can think of doing that sort of reconstructing the doctrines is something like that, right? So you have to, at the end of the day, reestablish some meaningful distinction between private right and mere ideological interest between fighting off government and mobilizing government to harass your neighbor. Again, that's a very, very hard thing to relearn, but here's my cheerful conclusion. It's not impossible, only German. <laughs> I can replay that goal if you want to see it. It's four seconds, if it works. It doesn't. <laughs> Thank you. Jeff. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Judge Katzis, for being here. I'm, I'm curious about your views on all this, of course. Um, and thanks, Adam, for inviting me. So as much as I like to talk about rulemaking, it's kind of refreshing to talk about adjudication for a change. So I welcome Mike's paper and the debate it has reopened, even though in the end I can't support his recommendation. Um, so, as you probably know, in the great compromise that led to the unanimous passage of the APA in 1946, after a decade of debate, it was agreed that Congress could assign federal cases to agencies as long as, first, the agencies had to use trial-type procedures to decide them as spelled out in the APA, second, that hearing officers with decisional independence, now called administrative law judges, would, pre would preside over them and make the first level decisions subject to agency head review. And third, that there would be subsequent judicial review in the Article III courts. That's the process that's still in effect today with one big variation, that we can have, also have less formal hearing procedures um, presided over by non-ALJ adjudicators for cases where Congress did not require a, quote, hearing on the record. So long as such procedures passed the Matthews versus Eldridge balancing test for due process. So this dichotomous set of formal and informal adjudications has been the norm for 70 years now. We've had very few scandals involving our administrative judiciary. So what's the problem? Well, Mike suggests that there has been some unfairness in some agencies like the SEC and the NLRB, that the new patent adjudication process created in 2012, I believe, is flawed. But he mostly points to breakdowns in high volume adjudication systems such as immigration and social security. So as a cure for these problems, as he said, he proposes to replace our current system with a full scale system of German style independent administrative courts which would decide these cases de novo. And in his paper, he envisioned 120 such courts with about 1,200 judges spread across the country with a federal administrative court at the system's apex. So at this point, I, I want to show, if I can, a few slides to illustrate. OK. So this is going to illustrate just what this administrative court would be supplanting. So this is a listing of all the administrative law judges that we have at least as of March 2017, which is the most recent one that I could find, um, that um, across the government. So you notice there are about, well, six, actually you can't see the bottom, but it, it's about 1,900 and some judges, administrative law judges. And 85% of them are, are in the Social Security Administration, and another five or 6% are in the Medicare appeals branch. So that's a lot of, uh, judges in those benefit programs and not so many in the other regulatory programs. Now this is a list of all the non-ALJ adjudicator programs um, that came out of a study by the administrative conference and it came up with a total of about 11,200 
non-administrative law judge adjudicators. Now, most of those are in the patent and trademark office, um, and a lot of them are just patent examiners, low-level judges, but there, you can see there are lots of judges um, deciding cases throughout various parts of the government who are not administrative law judges. So one might ask how these 1,200 new judges in the administrative courts could do the work now being done by almost 2,000 ALJs and 10,000 non-ALJs. Well, the main answer that Mike gives, I think, is that he would, he, as he just said, he would leave the social security system alone with its 800,000 cases a year. And I presume he would also leave out the Medicare appeals adjudications, about 80,000 cases, black lung benefit cases, 80, 800 cases a year, veterans benefit cases, 50,000 a year, which are appealed to the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, and 40,000 cases decided by the IRS uh, Office of Appeals, which are appealed to the tax court. Now these make up a huge percentage of our federal cases. So his focus is mostly on regulatory and enforcement cases, which actually make up a tiny proportion of the federal cases. And this kind of shows how this proportion has shrunk over the years. In 1947, 64% of all hearing examiners, as they used to be called, were in economic regulatory agencies. It went down to 45% in 1962, 19% in 74, 10% in 81, and by 2010, it was only 2% of all the um, ALJs. Um, also, benefits cases have gone up to the point where by 2017, it switched from 7% uh, in 1947 to 91% in 2017. And these are cases where policy issues are really infrequent. And they mostly involve you know, who did what to whom, when and where, questions of adjudicative fact. And those are cases where you don't really need the agency head to be involved very often. So I think that in those cases, there, there, there maybe there should be a specialized Article I court. So what about these regulatory cases? Well, what's the problem there? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I'm, I'm here to say that I don't think it's broke. Um, and Mike uses the SEC as a prime example. Now it's true that some, the well-endowed securities bar has mounted a longstanding challenge to the SEC's statutory power to use APA formal adjudication in, formal, in enforcement cases. And after the Dodd-Frank Act added new enforcement grounds to the SEC's arsenal, the, at the attack intensified, and then we had the result in the Lucia case concerning the illegal appointments of SEC ALJs. We could talk about that. But the due process challenges to APA adjudication have been unavailing, as have challenges based on the Seventh Amendment's right to a trial by jury and the Equal Protection Clause. As Professor David Zering has written, uh, formal adjudication under the APA, which is the process that SEC ALJs offer, has have been with us for decades and have never before been thought to be unconstitutional in any way. It violates no rights nor offends the separation of powers. If anything, scholars have bemoaned the fact that it offers an inefficiently large amount of process to defendants, administered by insulated civil servants which, who in no way threaten the president's control over the executive branch. Now, Professor Zaring is a kind of a centrist administrative law professor at the Wharton School, and he did an empirical study of decisions in SEC cases brought before its ALJs and compared them to the cases SEC brought in district courts in the five years after Dodd-Frank, and he found that basically the SEC was pretty successful in both and that there, there was no statistically significant distinction between the rates of success. So while I agree that there's always room for improvement in agency adjudication procedures, I disagree with Mike's premise that there is a fundamental problem with APA adjudication. There have been very few scandals, as I said, the Supreme Court has blessed it, and the SEC experience doesn't really undercut that assessment. On the other hand, I do acknowledge problems with backlogs and inconsistencies in mass adjudication programs like Social Security, immigration, and veterans. But Mike's proposal wouldn't cover those. And I think those problems might be better addressed by creating a specialized Social Security court or a broader benefits court that would act as an intermediary court before courts, cases could reach the Article III courts of appeals, a la the tax court and the veterans court. And I proposed this in a piece with Paul Verkeil, a Social Security court, and I also studied the Australian Appeals Tribunal that I'll mention if I have a, a minute at the very end. So, 
Um, my conclusion here is that I think there may be a role for more specialized Article I courts, but I think Mike's proposal is backwards. I would concentrate reform proposals not for the regulatory enforcement cases where agencies, meaning agency heads, can best make or apply agency policy in an accountable way in individual cases, but, I, but instead I'd concentrate my proposals in these mass adjudication programs where agency heads rarely need to be involved, policy making by adjudication is rare, and anyway can be better done through agency rulemaking. So that's my conclusion now. I know I have about 30 seconds, so I can see I want to, this is the chart showing how the administrative adjudication process works in the US complaint at the FTC, ALJ hearing, commission appeal, judicial review in the Court of Appeals. Judicial review is limited to the administrative record, okay? In Australia, they, we have the same agencies, ministries, and boards, but there's no APA that governs their procedures. So they can use any procedure they want. But the review is in this National Appeals Tribunal called an AAT, and it's de novo review. And it's final for factual decisions, for issues. If there's a legal issue, you can appeal it to the, the, the regular federal court systems in Australia. I think it works very well in Australia, and we recommended that it might work well in our benefits system here, but we're so much bigger than Australia. That tribunal has 329 judges on it. How many would we need if we put all of our cases in that tribunal? So I'll stop there. Thank you. I'm going to try to take a step back here. They've obviously covered a lot of detailed information, but just say what uh, I and a couple of others think is, are the fundamental questions here. Uh, and I'm going to endorse uh, Mike's proposal, and I'm going to start out by endorsing it for three reasons. First of all, it's simply consistent with what, with what we need today, uh, and that's what Ashley Parrish and I call modern liberal constitutional reform. Now, what is that? It's liberal reform that takes account of our need for accountability and our need for government action and government efficiency. Some call it government enablement. Accountability has three dimensions, fidelity, regularity, and transparency. And Mike's proposal is especially good because it homes in on regularity, making sure that like cases are treated alike. But it also has the virtue of ambition, and it also has, has the virtue that it doesn't tinker around the edges, but it goes straight to the heart of doctrine and straight to the heart of institutions. Now, the second point that I like about uh, Mike's proposal is its substance. And the best thing about the substance of Mike's proposal is it's there. There is substance. <laughs> Uh, as, as Mike said, the problem with New Deal administrative law jurisprudence uh, is it's substance free. And this is the arc of the law idea bends toward deference. But really, it's just the arc of the law in the New Deal era bends toward deference. And just to uh, play out the steps that Mike referred to briefly, we begin in 1943 with the Chenery decision. We learn that agencies have to give a reasonable explanation for their actions. And then we go to the Seminole Rock decision two years later, and we learn that their interpretation of their own regulation should not be disturbed unless it's patently erroneous. And then we go to the universal camera decision six years later, and we learn that their findings of fact should be not disturbed as long as they're supported by substantial evidence. Then we fast forward 27 years to Vermont Yankee, and again we find the court shouldn't be imposing procedures on them. Fast forward five more years to State Farm, same result for policy decisions, and then one more year to the granddaddy of all Chevron, same thing for statutory interpretation. So we have a very reticulated doctrine that carefully delineates between an agency's explanation and its fact-finding and its policy choices and its interpretation of statute and its procedures and its interpretation of regulation. And the only problem is it's the same standard again and again and again. Now that's not the arc of the law, and we're gonna get into that. That's just the arc of New Deal jurisprudence. So in order to find out how we get here and how we can move forward to liberal constitutional reform, we have to think a little bit about New Deal jurisprudence. And we're gonna use as our guide somebody who thought a lot about it, uh, 
Antonin Scalia, I think, was probably the second most influential justice uh, in Supreme Court history, uh, after Marshall, before Story. Uh, I think his influence was overwhelmingly positive, but what cannot be denied is he's almost certainly the most paradoxical justice ever to serve on the court when we look at his administrative law jurisprudence. So think of the resumes we heard in administrative law, and Adam, uh, uh, was uh, deferential enough not to have all of his accomplishments, but think of what an introduction for Justice Scalia would have looked like if he were here today. Head of the Administrative Conference of the United States, head of the Ad Law Section of the ABA, judge on the DC Circuit, professor of administrative law, head of the Office of Legal Policy at the United States Department of Justice. You almost can think of no better preparation for becoming a justice of the United States in dealing with administrative law. And then what did he do? Well, the paradox of Justice Scalia is all three of his most important administrative law decisions were renounced by him, either in whole or in part, explicitly or implicitly. He was probably the most steadfast judge, justice we've had in recent history, but he was least steadfast in the area that he was most expert. We begin with Auer v. Robbins, which he expressly and completely repudiated in the Decker case. We go on to Whitman uh, versus ATA, which he implicitly repudiated in the Michigan case. And then we end up with the granddaddy of the mall, Chevron, which he championed starting from his appointment in 1986, but came very close to repudiating the American Railroads case. And obviously, Justice Thomas uh, has expressly repudiated it. So the Scalia paradox is he is least steadfast and least certain of himself in the area where he had the preeminent expertise. Now why? Well, we talked about the arc of the law uh, as interpreted by a, a contemporary legal scholar, but what Justice Scalia did in all areas of his jurisprudence was reinterpret this famous statement. So uh, we all know that he would blanch at the idea of convenience. And however we talk about understood to be convenient or more or less convenient, uh, et cetera, the one thing that we know is that uh, Justice Scalia thinks law is law and convenience is convenience. If I didn't have that ellipsis in there, we'd be talking about moral and political theory uh, and he would object even more. So what Justice Scalia did in his thinking was to invert this uh, and qualify the life of the law in American courts has been logic known through experience. The life of the law in American courts is logic known through experience. Now that's a reinversion of Lord Cook, who was inverted by Holmes, so in a sense he's going back to the traditional notion of law. The life of the law in American courts is logic known through experience. Now, what would Justice Scalia say about that statement? Agree or disagree? Could you read? Great news. The speaker will table a resolution sanctioning New Deal jurisprudence. <laughs> it's a trick question for three, not only two reasons, right? Tabling a resolution can mean either putting it to the side or putting it forward in Britain. Sanction can either mean penalizing or approving. But New Deal jurisprudence can mean one of two things. It can either mean a body of decisions whether or not it's coherent, or it can mean an underlying principle underlying the New Deal. So if I wanted to attack the performance of, of Judge Katsas on the DC Circuit, I would say the DC Circuit's kernel law jurisprudence is incoherent ever since the arrival of Judge Katsas. <laughs> There's no unifying thread, it's self-contradictory. But if I wanted to talk about the highest accomplishments of unifying bodies of law, I would reach for that exact same word. Grotius, Pufendorf, and Berglamaqui are the giants of early modern jurisprudence. And so when we're talking about either a disconnected body of legal doctrine, or we're talking about a unified body of legal doctrine, we, we reach for the exact same word. And that's particularly important to Justice Scalia uh, as regards the New Deal, because Justice Scalia had a unique take uh, on the New Deal that's different 
uh, from the colleagues that we think about as being closest to him, such as Judge Bork uh, on the DC Circuit or Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court. Justice Scalia completely rejected and completely embraced New Deal jurisprudence. He completely rejected it in the sense that it was Holmesian, it had to do with convenience, had to do with administrative uh, workability, etc. But he worked as hard as he could to maintain the holdings and the essence of it. And that's most evident in cases like the Commerce Clause, his, his uh, uh, groundbreaking case, Smith versus Employment Decision, uh, in the First Amendment, Freedom of Religion area. But he couldn't make it work. He couldn't make this balancing act of completely embracing and completely rejecting the New Deal work uh, in the administrative law context, even though he was the most experienced, most distinguished judge in that context. And so where do we go from here? Well, the first thing is just one comment on what I think is the limitation of Mike's proposal. Uh, and then the way forward. And the limitation is just, I think he does a lot more with the regularity dimension of, of accountability than the fidelity dimension. The regularity dimension being consistency across cases and fidelity, meaning fidelity toward the commands of the sovereign. And we can talk about that more. But I think the other point is more general, is we're, we're in constitutional time now, we're in time where uh, as, as Ashley and I have said, these debates have broken out of the backwater uh, and, and they're more toward the forefront of political consciousness. And it's not a time or a context, I think, where you can come to the broader public and say, great news, we've got a model that's gonna work. I think what you have to do is say, great news, we understand uh, that a whole generation of jurisprudence, starting from the New Deal people and continuing with Justice Scalia, really broke their pick on trying to unify political accountability and political enablement. And they didn't uh, succeed, but we have to learn from where they left us and figure out a new way of performing that synthesis. Now, obviously, Ashley and I have some ideas on that, uh, which we can talk about in the discussion. Rob, I have to admit that was great and it forced me to sort of scramble to reorganize my own remarks a little bit based on what you, uh, what you amplified. Um, I have to admit when I first saw Professor Grieva's essay on law and liberty and then saw the draft, which uh, a version of which will be posted on our website not long after the event, um, I was struck by, uh, by Mike's suggestion that we should turn to the German example to fix this. I, for you know, as many years as I can recall, I've heard my friends at the Claremont Institute say that, that all this trouble started when uh, the German intellectuals got off the boat and turned our entire system of government around. But then I thought, well, it makes sense. It reminds me of, um, of the father who tells his son, you know, Adam, I brought you into this world, and so help me, I could take you out of it too. Um, so I think it's intriguing to look towards the German example for how to fix this, but I have to admit, while I agree with sort of the concerns animating your proposal, I, I have some notes of skepticism to add myself. You say in your draft that the root of the problem is the agency's dual role as policymaker and adjudicator. You say there's an uneasy balance in that role between agency adjudication and agency policymaking, and I agree with that, but perhaps we're uneasy about that balance because of the terms we use in describing this, administrative law judge, right? By calling these officers administrative law judges, we elevate our expectations about their impartiality, um, their independence, the way they go about making their decisions, and they're, they're removed from political influence, or what we might also call democratic accountability. Um, maybe if we use different terms to describe these officers, maybe revert back to hearing officer or something else, we'd have lower expectations uh, of administrative law judges, but on the bright side, we might have uh, more scrutiny on judicial review um, and more energy in judicial review of what they do. Now, I, I do disagree, though. I don't think the, rule, the real root of the problem we're talking about today is that dual role of, of agency officials. I think the real root, as with all of our administrative state, is the statutes. We haven't really spent much time talking about the substantive statutes by which Congress empowers these agencies to take action the statutes that ultimately the ALJs and the agency heads and the courts are interpreting. Ultimately, the real root of all of this is those 
statutes that grant us substantive power, and it's hard to imagine a way out of a lot of what we're talking about without reforming those statutes. Um, Rob, you talked about uh, Justice Scalia, and I'd mention him a little bit too. I'd say Justice Scalia was right when he said in Mistretta and elsewhere that anytime you have execution or adjudication, you're gonna have policy-making discretion of some sort. I mean, even uh, James Madison in Federalist 37 says that all statutory law is to some extent, some more than others, vague until it can be liquidated, its meaning can be liquidated through actual practice, through adjudications and deliberations. Um, so there's always gonna be some policy making discretion. So who do we want exercising that discretion? And also Scalia, I think, was right when he said in Chevron, I'm sorry, it's not just discretion, but it's policy making discretion. The statutes that Congress passed um, in our, you know, our actual lived experience are broad delegations of power. And so under those statutes, how should we best understand the work of the courts relative to the executive branch? I don't think there's a Scalia paradox, actually. I think with, with Scalia, what you see, these tensions within his work, just reflect Scalia trying to strike a balance between these competing concerns of the rule of law and also judicial restraint, which he cared so much about, um, and the discretion of policymakers and the duty of policymakers to, um, to, to basically breathe life, breathe life into these statutes through the way they administer them. So I don't think it's a paradox, I just think it's, um, whatever you wanna call it, a tragic choice, uh, striking a pragmatic balance, whatever you wanna call it. Um, so I think in all this, we have to fix the statutes first. I think it's hard to find a way out of a lot of what we're talking about today without fixing the substantive grants of power, or maybe at the very least fix the procedural statutes by which the agencies administer that power. I think we see the, the, the more thorough, transparent, iterative processes of rulemaking proposed in the Regulatory Accountability Act and elsewhere. Don't make administration more independent, more judicial, more removed from Article II. Rather, keep it within Article II and understand that this is a political activity. Um, just make it more transparent and participatory um, and accountable. But I do think there's room for small changes in judicial review, and I'll, I'll end with this, I'll be brief. Um, there's ways to improve judicial review of the agency's administration of these statutes. First of all, I agree, Justice Scalia, the word was always, or in, re, in his later years, that he was rethinking aspects of Chevron deference. I have no idea what he was going to do. I'd like to think maybe he would have moved in the direction of, um, of Chief Justice Roberts and King v. Burwell, or Judge Kavanaugh and some of his lower court opinions. Um, where he called for a more rigorous step zero, this major questions doctrine, which would take a subset of cases, the really big political or economic issues, out of the realm of judicial deference. Maybe he would have liked that, I don't know. Um, I do think you, you, you are on the point when you say the judicial review right now is really undermined by the way that agencies can enforce a lot of their decisions while the litigation is continuing. We saw that in Michigan versus EPA, where the EPA lost a major case in the Supreme Court, but still spiked the football afterwards because they had gotten the entire industry to already change its, um, the way it does things. We saw that in Sackett and elsewhere. Um, so maybe it's just a matter of changing the way that courts grant preliminary injunctions or, or stays of agency action. Right now the presumption is against them. Let's make the presumption in favor of them. Make the normal course of action that agency action is stayed until judicial review is done and put the burden on the government to prove it's an exceptional case where a stay should not be granted. Um, and one last thing, and I, I, I tread upon this ground very lightly, standing next to Judge Katsas, but maybe we should diversify judicial review out of the D.C. Circuit. So much of uh, agency action was reviewed in the D.C. Circuit where the case law is pretty well settled, pretty predictable, and pretty deferential. Maybe it would be a good thing for other circuits to hear more um, uh, to m hear more appeals of agency action. It, makes one, it made sense decades ago to route most of these reviews to the DC Circuit because transportation was costly and communication wasn't that great. Now airplanes are pretty cheap and so are long distance phone calls, let alone the internet. So there really is less of a justification to route these things to the DC Circuit. Why not have a lottery? Why not send a case to the Eighth Circuit or the Fifth Circuit or the Ninth Circuit? And the important thing is nobody will know where it's gonna go. The, judge, the, uh, the agency won't know, the litigants won't know create some uh, uncertainty and give other judges a bite at the apple and if nothing else, create more circuit splits that focuses more responsibility back in the Supreme Court to decide more of these issues. Again, with all apologies to Judge Katsas, I know he's got a lot of important work to do and I hate to start taking away so much of his caseload to other courts, um, but it might not be a bad idea. Um, so thank you very much. Mike, you want to take five or ten minutes to respond to 
whatever you want to respond to. I, I want, thanks, Judge. I, I, I just want to make this um, very brief. Um, I'm not sure I agree to start at the tail end. Um, and I'm, the, the reason why I hesitate to sort of say, yeah, that's also fine with me, is that the way you presented this gets us back into the frame of mind that I want to get out of. That is to say, sort of incremental improvements to judicial review, a term that I want to lose, um, and a, a focus on sort of rulemaking proceedings, big rulemaking proceedings, um, as opposed to sort of humdrum, um, you know, day-to-day -day quotidian permitting decisions, enforcement decisions, and so the rest of it. And I'm grateful to Jeff for uh, endorsing that reorientation. Adam, I wholeheartedly agree with your focus on, well, we have to, we have to start with the statutes. I agree with that. And the statute I want to start with is the APA itself, which is nearing its 75th anniversary. And it's, you know, time has come to put that dog out of its misery. There is a whole lot of, you know, talk and discussion about, um, ooh, maybe the original APA was a better idea than the sort of common law overlay that we now have. Maybe it's a statute in exile and we should now be APA originalists. I don't believe a word of it. Um, I think that so-called fierce compromise is a travesty and I've never made peace, of, peace with it and I never will. Um, and I want to sort of, one of the chief reasons I mean, as Rob suggested, I mean, the point of this, putting this out there um, uh, in a fairly worked out version is to sort of reopen a debate that otherwise I fear we may be uh, missing. And even if nothing comes off the sort of institutional proposal itself, I want to reorient um, the entire debate in roughly the direction I indicated. And Rob, I think, um, endorsed. Uh, and Jeff, it just, I mean, look, I, I have nothing against rethinking the way we handle asylum cases and immigration. That system, right, that's a mass adjudication system. And by all lights, it's working very, very poorly. Uh, I'm all in favor of sort of rethinking the way we handle sort of large volumes of Social Security, Medicare cases. But that to me, um, and, and Right? I did not want to foreclose that. I did not mean to say everything is in good order with those systems. Don't worry about it. I'm all aboard um, uh, with uh, sort of rethinking those things. But to my mind, those are sort of technocratic and managerial problems. They're not rule of law problems. Whereas what I think the, the regulatory stuff really is a fundamental constitutional and, and rule of law problem. And, and that is what this contribution is meant to bring into focus. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, sure. Jeff. I think I'd just like to make three points, I think. Um, first, um, with respect to the name change for administrative law judges, uh, maybe I should defer to an ALJ in the audience on this one. But, um, you know, so the history of the name of administrative law judges is kind of interesting. They originally were called examiners and then hearing examiners, when these cases were mostly regulatory, it made a little bit of sense back then, but the, the hearing examiners of the day really disliked the name, partly because they received a lot of mail from people who thought that their job was to test hearing. <laughs> and what, what, was, what was worse was the, the chief of those offices were called head examiner. <laughs> so, they, so they argued against, they, they, they persuaded the Civil Service Commission to change the name administratively in 1972, I think, and then in 78, the APA was amended. So I don't, I don't think going back to change the name would be helpful, especially since we call all sorts of Article I judges, judges, and what's really the difference between a tax court judge or a magistrate judge and a judge at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They act as judges, so I don't think that's a good idea. 
Um, let's see. Secondly, um, with respect to how old the APA is, I don't want to engage in ageism with respect to statutes. Oh, it's older. <laughs> Um, I can't count. <laughs> no, but you know the Constitution is pretty old too, and I don't think you want to jettison that, right? Um, so I don't think it's a question of how old it is. Um, and let's see, what was my third point? Oh, um, I, I guess there are some ways to um, make, yeah, and you mentioned them in your paper actually, you didn't talk about this, that there are some ways to maybe create more independent uh, judges through making, taking them out of the agencies and putting them in an independent core, or creating split enforcement models such as we have with OSHA and OSHRIC and things like that. But you have to ask yourself, if you, if, you, if you like the fact that the president's appointees, the heads of the agencies, are the ones who are charged with applying and making policy in agency adjudication, I mean, if you, if you don't like that, then maybe we should go to an administrative court. But if you want the president's administration to have some role in making these policy decisions in these cases, that's the system we have today. Um, can just, it, I get that. So first of all, apologies for miscounting the years since, in, since 1946. That's really atrocious. I can't count. Um, uh, it's not the age. It's that that statute was written sort of under the impression of the Great Depression and the war and by people whose model of administration was the Office of Price Administration. And if that doesn't make your skin crawl, uh, I don't know what will. Um, and I think um, the time has come to sort of think about sort of what an administrative um, uh, system for more modern times and circumstances might look like. And no, Jeff, I don't like the notion that the president's appointees make policy through adjudication and the rest of us are just sort of the instrument with which and through which and on whose backs the policy is being made. I think that's really a terrible system. I think we should rethink chainery too. I think if they want to make policy, then by all means let them write rules and have the review in the DC circuit. I think that's fine, but let the adjudication be actual article, I mean, actual independent adjudication. Anybody else? So, so let's, let's turn to questions. <coughs> uh, I'm just gonna exercise a moderator's prerogative and ask you one or two. So. I'm guessing there are some structural conservatives in the audience, so let me press you on some of those points. So to start with the Article Two point that Jeff was making, right? These, you say these judges have to be independent, independent of like the head of an independent agency, which probably sounds good to many of the people in this room, but also independent of the president, which might not sound so good. You're constructing these courts outside of Article Three, so the judges who are doing the adjudication have to be performing an executive function. And what's left of the president's responsibility to take care that that law be faithfully executed? Uh, yeah, that's another way of asking, is the US tax court constitutional? Right? Because nobody knows exactly what it is and, and how it's there. And the way the syllogism goes is, well, uh, if they're not Article Three judges and they aren't, and they aren't legislators or you know, sent there by Congress and they aren't, they must, by definition, be executive officers. Um, it, look, if that is a problem, um, and I don't know how, I, 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 to be honest, I wanted to sidestep that problem. Okay. Uh, it, no, there, there is a, it, it, not all of you have seen the draft paper. There's a section left open, which is about the US tax court as a possible model. And it's easy to see what makes me, what attracts me to it, right? It has de novo review of deficiency determinations. It's highly 
incredible. It has a high volume of cases. It exercises a great deal of independence, has a great deal of credibility, it is by all measures uh, working remarkably well. There is that big structural problem in lurking in the background. And if you want to be a fundamentalist about the separation of powers, it's a really serious problem. If it goes that way, that, and that's why I wanted to be agnostic about it, to the extent that we take that problem really, really seriously, then by all means, either make them adjuncts to ordinary courts, right, like bankruptcy right. judges, or else make them Article Three judges. I have an open mind about all of that. But, but their decisions are reviewable by Article Three courts. Yeah. And it, look, that, that is, it, I, okay. Well, I thought yeah. you should. Can no. I make a point here? The, yeah. Go ahead, Rob. This is interesting. Let me use one of Mike's slides where he uses absolutely standard nomenclature that's completely wrong. <laughs> Thank you for that. No, but this is this gets to this point. Can you? I don't know how that beast works, Rob. Oh, here we go. Let me see if I can go back. Can somebody pull up Mike's presentation? No, all, all the way back to Mike. Now, this isn't, this isn't mine. This is Mike's presentation. It, it, can you I'll, I'll show you. Can what it, make what it, the point conceptually? Yeah, what it has to do with is the nomenclature of Article I courts. And that is completely erroneous and pollutes all of our thinking. Now, what's completely wrong about that? An Article I court, if it existed, would be something like the U.S. Court of Claims, I, I believe, in its early days, right? You have a judicial-like process, uh, you know, like in Bauscher v. Shiner, uh, uh, Sinar. You come up with a theory about whether Congress owes money and you pass a bill. That's an Article I court. Then there are Article II courts uh, that adjudicate benefits. Benefits, not what Mike is talking about in Article II. Okay, so that's why the tax court is like Social Security people or veterans people or Medicaid people. All we're doing is, is we're saying uh, a tax decision on behalf of a taxpayer is just like giving them money. Mm -hmm. So if we can give them money, uh, a taxpayer can come to the tax court instead of saying, I'm going to pay the tax, give me a rebate, and just uh, have you not have it. So the tax courts aren't a problem. Now when we get to bankruptcy courts, there is no way that those are Article I courts. They're created by Congress, you say. Well, guess what? The DC Circuit is created by Congress. It's from Adam. The Supreme Court is the only court that is not created by Congress. So with that nomenclature, if the bankruptcy court is an Article I court, then the district court to which is an adjunct is an Article I court, and so is the DC Circuit. So we need a whole new nomenclature here because what we have is Article I courts, and I'm not sure any of them exist anymore. We have Article II courts in certain instances that closely follow constitutional structure. But again, this is the intuition point as opposed to the express courts. And then we have a completely erroneous nomenclature and usage when it comes to bankruptcy courts. And if we just straightened out that nomenclature, I think it'd be probably pretty clear that, you know, we would end up accommodating what, what Judge Cassis is calling the structuralists by making them adjuncts to Article III courts. If we didn't want it to be a specialty Article III court, right, it's that whole apparatus of appointment by uh, the Court of Appeals, uh, general reference of administrative law cases according to standing orders over to the magistrate type judges with opportunity to withdraw the reference in certain instances. So I think that's a technical issue that's easily solved congruent with Mike's proposal. So what about, what about Article 3? Um, you, you describe the, one of the triggers for what goes into this court as private rights disputes. Yeah. Um, but of course, the only reason they can go into a non-Article 3 court is the current jurisprudence calls them public rights. Do, do you worry that um, you're sort of undercutting the Gorsuch Roberts project of reclaiming private rights as things that have to go to an Article III court <clears throat> by legitimizing a, a junior varsity Article III court? Uh, that's a terrific question, Judge. I've worried about it um, and stopped worrying about it after oil states energy. <laughs> 
um, because I think nothing will come off that project, right? It's, I mean, okay, so constitutional rights. Yeah, I get it. Maybe sort of a handful of things that look really like core common law claims. That's private right. And everything else falls into this vastly overbroad public rights category, and therefore anything goes, right? And I mean, that is the obvious alternative. If, and, and there are academic th theorists who, um, or scholars who have thought along those lines, trying to rehabilitate some meaningful notion of private right. I just don't see that going anywhere. And that's why I go sort of the institutional rather than the conceptual route. But it is in sub it's a terrific question. It's in substance the same project. Well, w one more for me, this, this time channeling Justice Scalia and the, the Mistretta dissent, and your, your take on rulemaking versus adjudication, right? Your, your worldview is, in terms of agency action, rulemaking good, adjudication bad. His view was adjudication is fine because there's nothing inherently judicial about it. It can be executive. Rulemaking is problematic and is legitimate only insofar as it's ancillary <coughs> to adjudication. The stated goal of this is to make adjudication, agency adjudication just dry up. Is the upshot of that you're just creating a bunch of junior varsity congresses that have the same sort of problem that he saw in the Sentencing Commission, um, which is they do nothing but rulemake. Uh, well, no, presumably those agencies would still enforce their own rules, right? Maybe, sub subject yeah. to starting from scratch, and de novo trials and review in, in the administrative courts. I'm not sure. See, um, Mike, can I? Yeah. Answer this? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to, but look, here's uh, the easiest way to think about it is FDA licensing of pharmaceuticals and medical devices, right? Uh, so there's a very broad delegation of authority. You get a license. There's no, no problem with that. Safe and effective, we'll call it. Okay, so on day one, uh, there's an adjudication of safe and effective. Now, there's a fixed body of law and a fixed body of fact as to whether my pharmaceutical or my medical device is safe and effective or whether it's equivalent uh, to a device that's been waived in. Yeah, that's fixed and they can't game me on that. And so they got to give me the license or not giving me the license and if they don't, let's say for present purposes, I'm going to go to the administrative equivalent of a bankruptcy court that's going to be an adjunct to an Article III court. Okay, so we're all good from separation of powers. Then what Mike says is they don't like what that adjunct is doing, so they have the trump card of that regulation. They can say, now we're defining safe and effective as X, Y, Z, and we're overruling it not to Rob's pharmaceutical, but to Adam's pharmaceutical. So that's why we have regularity, uh, and a lot of regularity, and we, we're confining this rule of law, this accountability problem, we're still allowing uh, agencies ultimately to make the policy and to find what safe and effective means. I think, you know, it's something, I think Mike is thinking something along those lines. Yeah. If, Jeff. Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to do away with Chenery and, and tell agencies that they can't make policy through case-by-case -case adjudication, why do we have a case or controversy requirement in the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court makes all of its constitutional policy and all the other policy it, it, it makes, which, which we can't you know, deny, through case-by-case -case adjudication. And the Supreme Court isn't, isn't a constitutional court like a lot of European countries. It, it can't, it's not a, a court like in China where they, they issue rules. Um, so case-by-case -case adjudication seems to be in the Constitution as the way that, that our, our courts should make the policies, policies that they make through their adjudications. So why should an agency be able to do that if it prefers to do it that way? Adam has allowed me to run over, so we have, oh, just anybody else? We have plenty of time for questions, so let's turn it over yeah. to the audience. Yes. And there's a microphone, so wait for the microphone to come. 
So uh, with deference to facts, it seems that uh, having the agency or the executive appoint the adjudicator, it creates a lot of uh, separation of powers problems there. So instead switching to more of a magistrate judge or an adjunct of an Article III court makes a lot of sense from what you're talking about. But then how do we run like the NLRB or something that really runs everything through adjudication? Or is the NLRB now not going to be able to do what they've been doing in the past? They're going to have to do everything through rulemaking? I would, first, uh, I explicitly took that off the table, the, right? So that's, that's why I meant, I mean, CFTC, for brevity's sake, I sort of put the CFTC example in there. Those are cases between and among private parties, right? Uh, and on those, I would probably, to pick up Judge Katz's suggestion or hint, I would probably, I mean, I'd have to think more about it, but I would say, no, those are probably questions of private right that you cannot commit to agency adjudication ever. Right? And as for, I mean, if you really want to have sort of, I mean, I, I've never, I've never comprehended why there is an NLRB, but if we absolutely have to have one, um, you know, by all means, let them make policy through more rules. I think, right, the, the, the sort of freewheeling environment in which they sort of make policy, you know, and just spring it on you um, is really a problem. And there, again, there are proposals to sort of think about it, have increased fair warning requirements, right, before the agency changes course and makes new policy by means of uh, adjudication. Aaron Nielsen has a suggestion like that. Um, yeah, maybe that's a little in, or a small improvement, but you think about this hard and long and hard enough, and you end up with sort of having to rethink January 2. If I may, what I don't understand about this, when we talk about this dichotomy between rulemaking and adjudication, and yeah, I understand the value of moving more and more to rulemaking, so is ex ante notice. But I think it's wrong to say you could ever, as you phrase it, say do everything through rulemaking because no rule written in advance can ever predict all of the sort of the cases they're going to follow. Any written rule is always going to leave room, some more or less, for interpretation. Even factual judgments so often are really mixed, you know, value judgments as much as not as much as they are, but facts, but they have value judgments yeah. in them. I mean, I'd like to think as a good Burkean, there's something to be said for case by case. I'd, I mean, I try to be a good Burkean. Um, there's something to be said for sort of deciding things case by case at the margin. And the more that we try to push things into rulemaking for very good reasons, we do sort of take on this, this, this conceit that we can predict everything in advance. I think that in some ways adjudication, I quibble with the word adjudication, but this, this backward looking sort of um, enforcement discretion or, or exercise of yeah. some discretion by the agency is just a concession to reality that sometimes we don't know quite what the policy is at the finest level until the case actually arises. Yeah, and uh, I, sorry, Adam, I may be sort of, after 90 minutes, I may be losing it or <laughs> not, not being able to follow. But so they have an agency rule. The SEC has a rule, okay? And they think somebody has broken it, right? Mm -hmm. And they send them an order and, and explaining, you've broken the rule, here's the damages, you pay us $500,000, okay? And either that private, that's the administrative act as the German lawyers would say. And either the party says, dang it, you know, I'm guilty, I'll pay them the 500,000. Or else he or it sues the living daylights out of the agency and then the question is, in what forum do you want to have that dispute, right. okay? Nothing in that proposal whatsoever prevents the agency from exercising its enforcement discretion enforcement discretion, not its adjudicatory apparatus, enforcement discretion in a way so as to sort of send signals to the community out there, um, to the regulated entities, right? To give them some sense where things are going uh, and to set the deterrence level at wherever the agency sees fit. I, what am I missing? Just to be clear, I don't mean enforcement discretion, I mean the interpretive discretion that's inherent in enforcement. 
right? That, that anytime you enforce the law, you're necessarily interpreting what the law means. And there's always going to be some margin, some margin in there that, that requires case by case judgment by the agency. I, I guess, yep. I mean, the thrust of my, the thrust of my comments throughout tonight are, I, I, you and I agree so much on sort of what's animating our criticism of the administrative state. In the end, I, 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 I'm comfortable throwing more of it back to political accountability um, rather than to courts. Okay, next question. Yeah, I'm Alex, Alex Manuel. I'm a uh, AJ with U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, my question is primarily for Professor Gassaway, um, since you're from Chicago, but also <laughs> the panel may want to want to comment. I wonder if you're familiar with the work done by Malcolm Rich, who's a professor in Chicago, uh, where he has studied these so-called state central panel systems that exist in 30 states currently, and uh, 10 other states are still studying that. I wonder if you can comment on and see that, do you think that has some ap applicability <coughs> to the federal uh, regimen? I know that work. And um, I've looked at state administrative systems in some detail. Sorry. No, that was go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Directed at you. Yeah, but no, okay, go ahead. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so in these, the, as you know, these panel systems come in various shapes and forms, right? Um, the closer you come, I mean, it, it depends on the appointment provisions and the review provisions. Um, so some states, Louisiana, South Carolina, have a panel system that says these panel decisions are final and not reversible for any reason by the agency. And Louisiana is even more extreme. It says that adverse decisions in the panel can be appealed to the ordinary courts by the private party, but never by the agency. Wow. Um, once you're at that extreme, the Louisiana model or even the, the so South Carolina model, uh, it looks darn, I mean, Jeff suggested as much, it looks darn close to what I have in mind. But I think, so, I think that extreme model is a mistake to go that, to go that far. And there's a good article by Jay Bybee yeah. who, who criticizes the Louisiana APA amendments that, that did that. I have no idea what drove Judge Bybee to wrote, write that you article. Know. It's pretty con it was convincing to me. <laughs> I know. Do you have anything? Uh, I, I'm familiar with the work. I, I'm not familiar with the particular paper that, that uh, you cite. But I do think uh, that, in general, that's a good model to follow and a good uh, body of experience to draw on. I'll leave it Can at I that. Can I say one more thing about that? Sure. So, so I think, as you know, Judge, um, a, a lot of the states have smaller groups of administrative <laughs> judges, administrative law judges in the federal government. And a lot of states, and some states have had more scandals in their system, and, and there's, there may be a good reason to set up a central panel system in states. And, I, and a lot of states, to, over half the states have done it. And I think a lot of them work. Although most of the panels accept some cases, like workman's comp cases are not covered in a lot of states and things like that. So I think the model works pretty well in the states. Whether it would translate to the federal government where, as I said, 91% of the ALJs are in the um, Medicare and SSA um, agencies, I'm not sure it would work. And folding in all the AJs would be an interesting puzzle. Can I just make one quick point of clarification? Also, with the AJs, there are over 10,000 AJs, most of whom, according to the ACA study, do uh, adversarial proceedings. So it's not just benefits analysis. Right. But I don't think 10,000 of them do. Uh, well, I, I, that's what the agency has. <laughs> let, let me just say that I do think one of the real puzzles for this and what Mike's doing, uh, with all my sympathy, is what do you do for that part of what Ashley and I call core administrative law that involves benefits? And, you know, everybody hives off immigration and taxes and territorial courts and military courts, blah, 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 blah. But what you do at, at HUD or uh, what uh, the Social Security Administration or the medical people do, that really is core administrative law. And I understand what Mike is saying is I want people who are specialized in regulatory cases like the FDA cases, the SEC cases, etc. cetera. Uh, but I also understand what others say, uh, uh, which is this is a part of core administrative law that also should be faithful and regular, etc. And I also understand uh, uh, Professor Lover's statistics that says if you're trying to get a specialized court in regulatory cases, 
and you lop all that together like I would, uh, then as a practical matter, everybody's going to specialize in benefits law because benefits law in 90% of the cases. So I do think that the problem we were talking about before, the Article I problem, has almost an inevitable solution that it would end up becoming an adjunct Article III court, not unlike the bankruptcy courts. I don't think this question of jurisdiction has kind of that kind of inevitable solution for what it's worth. Hi, my name's James. Uh, my comment is that my concern with this proposal is one that I've had with other efforts to look at how administrative law is done in other countries, and that is that it lumps together the problem of structure and the problem of resources. And you indicate, yes, we need to have enough resources. My concern is that in order to all sorts of bad things can happen when the executive and both policy making and fact finding that needs to be policed. But to be effectively policed, adjudicators have to have the independence and the tools and the time necessary to in, uh, really dig into that behavior. So I see the arc of deference, you know, arc of law bending towards deference as people become overwhelmed and even if they're independent, don't have the opportunity to really dig in. And so I question, how do you disaggregate those two things um, so that you're confident that this structure actually leads to people who have the time to get past the incentive of agencies to not be transparent about what they're doing when they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, because the, like the example of the Australian system, I've seen that proposed before, and when I saw it proposed for veterans' benefits, my comment was, well, yes, but they're spending almost 20 times the amount of money per case. And if you gave the adjudicators in VA 20 times longer to spend with each file, you would be dramatically happier with the quality of their work, too. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Um, it. Full agreement. I mean, the, the resource issues are uh, serious. And I, I mean, I've taken sort of this wild guess. Here's how many we, we might need, right? Um, and then, of course, how many you would need depends on factors like the ones you mentioned. I mean, how closely do you want to, you know, want, uh, do you want them to look and, and all the rest of it? The best, I mean, the, my only suggestion with respect to the incentive problem you mentioned that is, you know, at the end of the day, overwhelmed with all these case files, they look the other way, right? And then it'll be deference again. Um, that's why I sort of, why, not sort of, that's why I proposed tentatively the jurisdictional competition model. That is to say, you give those new courts a constituency building and reputational incentive to be, we're better than agency adjudicators, and at the end of the day, we're better than Article Three courts, or not better than Article Three courts, but better than their doctrines. You can trust us. You can come to us. And I think that's happened with a lot of parts of the, the judiciary, right? You can easily think of examples. I think the, the US tax court, for all its problems and structural problems, has built credibility over time, right? And remember, it was originally a board. It was ex executive. Nobody even thought it was a court, right, until people changed their minds on that. Um, and mind you, the federal judiciary <laughs> itself, right, in the 19th, throughout the the early decades of the, the 19th century had to build up credibility. And it did so in a very, very deliberate way and in a constituency building way. Uh, and it's on those kinds of institutional mechanisms and incentives that, that, that I place my hope. Do the German courts have any institutional ability to sort of make sure that they have the resources? Uh, yes, uh, they do. Now, mind you, uh, I mean, but the way they're, I mean, just in terms of sheer money, or do we have enough people here, or what do you mind, so mean? They say, like, we need to do this. We need this data integrity doctrine. You, know, you said there's a built in, there must be enough courts. And I just didn't yep. know if they had a way to not only police the executive, but also police the larger structure that they're getting enough bandwidth to make sure that they're doing an effective job and they can't sort of be undercut by the lack of public support or whatever it is to give them the resources to really do the job in a world where 
the agency work gets ever more complex, and they have more and more incentive just to try and obscure things so that whoever's doing the oversight can't do an effective job. They have an enormous reputation, and they have that reputation to defend. And the constitutional backdrop, you have to have access to a judge, prompt, effective, immediately, right? They take the, the constitutional commands very, very seriously. So I cannot imagine that any state, uh, and mostly these are, I mean, the, the, the system works differently. The sort of the, the federal administrative court is federal, but the lower courts are actually state courts, um, uh, that any state would shortchange them. I've never, ever heard of it. But it sounds like promptness is a bludgeon, so that you know, if the agency doesn't cooperate and they can't get the case adjudicated in a timely way, that doesn't end up being a win for the agency. That ends up being a loss. Right. So that, that seems like a big structural difference that allows That the helps. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yes. They cooperate in like terms of here's the information you really need to understand and, and do an effective adjudication. It is a hard like the problem with Chevron is if you go to the courts and the agency won't give the courts information that they need to do effective review, then deference means the agency wins by just being uh, intransigent. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 that is one dimension where I said, it, it, look, we can't replicate sort of an inquisitorial system, right? So the reason why, I mean, it, it, I, I sort of snarled at uh, Judge Bybee, I, I apologize. What that article says is these panels, at least the Louisiana panel, it's neither fish nor fowl and it compromises the use of expertise. And the reason why the Germans don't worry about a loss of expertise is if the court needs an expert, it'll hire one, or the parties will hire one, right? That's not a problem. If it needs evidence, I mean, these courts conduct site visits, if that's what it takes. We can't replicate that. That is just not our system. And there are also right? three judge panels, right? Uh, they are three, yeah, it, yes, there are three judge panels, um, except for very easy cases where you can make with, with a, a single judge. I think we've come to the end of the formal session of the program. Uh, Mike and all the panelists will be available at the reception yeah. for and a while. And if I might just say in closing, first of all, thank you all for joining us. Second, in addition to the Gray Center staff and the White House Historic Association staff that makes these events possible, I do want to especially recognize the two students that have helped make tonight's event possible. One is Conrad Meek. He's one of the Gray Center's Hamilton Fellows. And then in addition, uh, Michael Zhang, uh, the, the student who's, who's taking all the pictures tonight. So thank you to everybody who made the event possible, and thank you to our speakers.